right. Galatians chapter 5. Enough foolishness. <laughs> Galatians 5. Let, let me read to you a couple verses from Romans 8, and then we'll look at Galatians 5. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son, Jesus, in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so condemn sin in the flesh, listen to these words, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now look with me in uh, Galatians 5, if you're there. We're going to start reading in verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you can not do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one of us should test our own actions. Then they can take pride of themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the joy of the Lord uh, in the believers in Nepal, and thank you for the joy of the Lord right here in this room. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would come and breathe life among us. Let us encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. How do I overcome the desire for sin in my life? How do I overcome the natural bent towards sin that I was born with, that we're all born with? How do I get on the winning side of the battle against sin and stay on the winning side. The last time that we were together, we talked about the frustration of religion in Romans chapter 7. It's a frustration that all of us who want to live for Jesus have experienced. The good things that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things that I don't want to do are the things I end up doing. Paul says, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And Jesus answers, the who. The who is Jesus Christ. And then we roll into Romans chapter 8. Pastor Nick started us last week on Romans chapter 8, the great chapter in the New Testament on the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 21 times in Romans 8. That's more times than in any other chapter in the New Testament. Pastor Nick started telling us about the ministries of the Holy Spirit. And one of those ministries of the Holy Spirit is that he subdues my sin nature. I have to be perfectly honest with you. I've been a believer in Jesus for 42 years. I've been through two Bible colleges. I've been through seminary. I've been in ministry for more than 25 years. I've read more pages of theology and Bible commentary than I can count. But I have never yet heard anyone explain victory over the sin nature in a way that really satisfies me. Every time I hear someone talk about overcoming this sin nature, I'm always left with questions. How does it work? And what am I supposed to do? So I hope maybe I can help you understand a little bit this morning what I have wished to understand my whole life. Here's how I do not overcome my sin nature. I do not overcome my sin nature by dwelling on the things that I should no longer do. The answer to temptation is not now, nor has it ever been reminding myself of all the thou shalt nots. You see, that's trying to live by the law. That's living by religion. And we found in Romans 7 that only leads to frustration. 
Paul says that God's answer to the problem of my sin nature is the Holy Spirit inside of me. Romans 8.13 says that the way that we put to death the misdeeds of the flesh is through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.5 says that if we live in the Spirit, the Spirit will help refocus our minds on the things that God desires rather than what on our sinful flesh desires. That word translated live in the Spirit is actually the word walk. And to walk means your daily habits of life, the routines of your everyday life, the, the content of your days and months and years. In Romans 8, 4, Paul says that when we live or when we walk according to the Spirit, we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. But I find that Paul doesn't really elaborate here in Romans 8 what it means to walk in the Spirit. He tells us the outcomes of walking in the Spirit, but he doesn't tell us how to walk in the Spirit. That's why I want to reach over to Galatians chapter 5 and 6 this morning because Galatians 5 and 6 is the parallel passage to Romans 8. And from Galatians, we get a little clarity. We get a little help understanding what it means to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the potent antidote for our sin nature. The Holy Spirit in us overpowers our sin nature and subdues it. You know, for years I never realized that there is an awesome promise in Galatians 5.17. Paul says the spirit desires what is contrary to our sinful nature. They are at war with each other so that we cannot do whatever we want. I always read that negatively. Like Romans 7.19, the good I want to do, I don't do. But that's not what Paul means here in Galatians. This time... Paul is saying that the Spirit wants what is contrary to my sin nature and the Spirit makes war against my sin nature so that my sin nature can't do the bad deeds it wants to do. In other words, this time the Holy Spirit wins. This time he gets what he wants. Here's a tweetable line for you. I am no match for my sin nature, but my sin nature is no match for the Holy Spirit. But I find that the mechanics of Christian victory are a bit of a paradox. On the one hand, I'm told I'm powerless to do anything. Indeed, I'm told if I try to do anything in my own strength, it's offensive to God. But on the other hand, I am told I must do something. So which is it? Well, it's both in the right order. The truth is, you and I are completely powerless against our own sin nature. There is absolutely nothing we can do to overcome the sin nature in our own strength. It's only by the help of the Holy Spirit that it can be subdued. But we can welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. We can promote the work of the Holy Spirit within us by cooperating with him, by responding affirmatively to him. We, just as with saving faith itself, there is a response required on our part, and that is to surrender our will to him. We see both sides of this paradox in Paul's words. On the one side of the coin, Paul describes the work that only Christ and the Holy Spirit can do that we cannot do ourselves. He said those who, have belonged to, those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires and now we live by the Spirit. You see, there is a moment of faith. There is a moment of believing on Jesus during which a supernatural transaction takes place. In a way that I can't even explain to you, by faith I become united to Christ and his experiences on the cross, his experience in the resurrection becomes my spiritual experience. My old nature is crucified on the cross with Jesus and my spirit which was dead in sin is resurrected with Jesus and comes alive. 
what transpires is so radical that Jesus called it being born again. Paul called it becoming a new creation. And then God pours the Holy Spirit into my heart. And the Holy Spirit is the one who keeps my old nature on the cross with Jesus and keeps my resurrected spirit alive. All that is God's work. That happens by his power alone. But on the other side of the coin, Paul uses imperatives. He uses command words that call me to action. Live by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Stay in step by the Spirit. Sow to the Spirit. I would suggest to you that all those command words are synonyms for the same call to action on my part. Overcoming my sin nature is the work of the Holy Spirit alone, but I welcome that work by continually surrendering to Him. I promote and I accelerate that work by continually walking in the Spirit. So how do I do that? How do we walk in the Spirit? I want to give you four ways that I find in Paul's words quickly this morning. Four ways that we walk in the Spirit. First of all, we walk in the Spirit by staying connected to the Spirit, by daily feeding our faith. We stay connected to the Spirit by daily feeding our faith. Overcoming our sin nature is completely the work of the Holy Spirit, but there is a role that we play. And that is to maintain our connection with the Spirit by constantly feeding our faith. You know, faith is how we receive the Holy Spirit in the first place. Paul says in Galatians 3, 2, you receive the Spirit by believing on Christ. And ongoing faith is the way that we continue receiving the Spirit. Galatians 3, 4, God continues to pour His Spirit on you because you continue to believe. Paul says that the way we live the crucified life in our bodies is by faith. I am crucified with Christ, and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Both faith and the Spirit are supernatural resources that are in need of constant replenishment. Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith. Paul says, be continuously refilled with the Holy Spirit. So how do we do that? How do we feed our faith so that we remain connected to the Spirit? A couple of things I see quickly. First of all, we feed our faith with the Word of God. Now faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the Word, the Word of God. As we fill ourselves with the word, it feeds our faith. It informs our faith. It reinforces our faith. It grows our faith. And that, in turn, strengthens our connection with the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught the same thing in John 15. Jesus said, remain in my word, and I will remain in you, and you will bear much fruit. Isn't that something? Jesus said, you remain in my word, and if you do, I'll remain in you. Isn't that amazing how we can get into the word of God and our being in the word of God strengthens our connection with him. And the word plays an important role in subduing our sin nature. The word reminds us of who we are because of whose we are. And that's something we need to be reminded of every day. The word reminds me that I have been crucified with Christ, that I am a new creation, that I am a new lump of unleavened dough. Jesus has done the impossible. He has gone through the lump of my being and he has separated the yeast of sin from me through the blood of Jesus. The word reminds me that I am the righteousness of God in Christ, that I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me. You know, how would it change the way you feel about your daily Bible reading if rather than regarding it as a duty, you saw it for what it truly is? It is walking in the Spirit. Rather than seeing it as a duty, rather than seeing the goal of your Bible reading as just gathering information, what if you saw your Bible reading as the means to your transformation? 
What if you saw it uh, as the means of strengthening your connection with him? Remain in my word and I'll remain in you. As you get into my word, I get more and more into you. How would it change the way you feel about Bible reading if you realize that it's the key to making the changes inside that you've been asking God to help you make? How do I feed my faith? Very closely related to the word is worship. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to public lewdness, but be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. How? Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making music to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to him. You see, worship is the partner of the word. The word is the content of our worship. And as we repeat the word, singing it over and over again, speaking it aloud, the truths of the word are driven deep into our heart. Worship creates the atmosphere where the spirit abides and where the spirit is control. God abides in the praises of his people. He is enthroned in the praises of his people. He resides and he reigns where there is worship. Worship creates the atmosphere where the Holy Spirit speaks to me. The Old Testament prophet said, bring me a minstrel, and then we'll see what God has to say. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and he says, when we're gathered for worship, we should anticipate in that environment, God is going to speak. Beloved, listen to me as much as you can. Fill the atmosphere around you with worship and the word in your home, in your car, if it's possible for you, in your workplace. Fill the atmosphere with worship. And listen, I'm going to get in trouble, but expand your worship beyond K-Love, all right? <laughs> now listen, I like K-Love. I have K-Love on in my car all the time. But I want to tell you that there is other worship music that is anointed to take you to a deeper place in the Lord. There, there's other worship music that that is inspired by the Holy Spirit that takes you to a place where you're soaking in his presence. Pastor Jason and Elizabeth are working on some playlists for you, some recommendations. So, you know, I'm terrible. I never know. I, I never know who sings what, what artist, who records it. I don't know any of that information. I'm terrible. Uh, so they're working on some titles and some, uh, uh, some composers and some places where you can access some music that just helps you soak in the presence of the Lord. How do I feed my faith? With word, with the worship, with praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. Paul says, when you pray in tongues, you build up your inner man, you strengthen your spirit. Jude says that we build ourselves up in faith by praying in the Spirit. We're coming to Romans 8, 26 very quickly about how the Spirit helps us to pray. But briefly, when we pray in tongues, we are partnering with the Holy Spirit in prayer. You know, I have to tell you the truth. The best thing about being away for the last two weeks is that I had no news from the United States, so I didn't have to hear about the election. I didn't have to watch the debate. The only, the only snippets of news I got was on Facebook, and that was terrible enough as it is. I have to be honest with you, I don't even know how to pray about this election. I really don't know how to pray. So I've decided to just pray in the Spirit. I have decided to just, you know, because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes. When we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit comes, and he makes intercession through us in agreement with the will of God. So... Can I tell you, there are times that it's impossible to even discern what is the will of God, and only God knows. And so uh, praying in the Spirit is really, in this season, a tremendous source of comfort for me uh, as I just partner with the Holy Spirit and pray in agreement with God's will. How do I feed my faith? We'll end the short list with fasting. Scripture and Jesus himself says that fasting is a key to breaking spiritual strongholds off ourselves and off others. Fasting is an exercise of faith. And when we fast, we trust God to sustain us. We're practicing the denial of our fleshly appetites and drawing on God for strength instead. Fasting increases our ability to hear the Holy Spirit. It is a way of walking in the Spirit. How do we walk in the Spirit? Four ways. Number one, feed your faith so that you can strengthen your connection with the Spirit. Number two, for the sake of the rest of us, please address your own issues. For the sake of the rest of us, please 
address your issues. In Galatians 4, Paul says each one should test his own actions without comparing himself to someone else, for each should carry his own load. What's interesting is that just a moment before, Paul said, carry each other's burdens. It sounds like a contradiction. In one breath, he says, carry each other's burdens. And in the next breath, he says, each should carry his own load. It's not a contradiction if you realize that Paul uses two different words. The burdens that we help others carry are a load too big for one man to carry alone. But the burdens that Paul tells us to carry on our own is a personal size burden, like a backpack. So Paul is saying, take responsibility for your own spiritual issues. Deal with your own backpack. In Philippians, he said it this way, work out your own salvation. He doesn't say work for your salvation. He says work on your salvation. So we grow in the spirit. We walk in the spirit by taking inventory and asking, where do I need to grow? Where do I need to grow? Take inventory of yourself. Specifically, Paul says, test your actions. Don't tell me what's in your heart. Don't tell me the good intents that you have, the good thoughts, the good feelings, the desire to do good things. What do you actually do? As you look at the two lists at the end of chapter 5 in Galatians, the works of the flesh versus the works of the Spirit, what issues do you see in your own life out of those lists? Do you need to be in pathways addressing old hurts and habits and hang-ups? Men, do you need to be in fellowship with other Christian men here every Monday evening? Do you need to be in the men's group that meets on Tuesday evenings? Brothers and sisters, do you, do you need to take cleansing stream? When it comes around again, do you need to finish what you started and go to the cleansing stream retreat? Do you need to get deliverance prayer? Go get it. Do you need to get godly Christian counseling? Go get it. Do you need godly marriage counseling? Go get it. Do you need godly financial counseling? Go get it. Deal with the issues in your backpack. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you address those things. And here's the thing. Beyond your own personal peace and joy, addressing your issues is ultimately for everyone else's sake. Carry your own load. Take responsibility for your own growth. Deal with the things in your backpack and then you can help others who are carrying loads that are too big for them to carry on their own. And that brings us to the third way we walk in the Spirit. Serve others in love, just like Jesus did. Serve others in love, just like Jesus did. The whole context of Galatians 5 and 6 is loving others like Jesus loved us. Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 6, religious rituals mean absolutely nothing. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. Verse 13, Christ has set you free not to indulge your sin nature, but to serve one another in love. For the whole law is fulfilled in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Beloved, listen to me. Walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, staying in step with the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit, it all has the goal of subduing our sin nature so that we can love people like Jesus loved. You see, when we believe on Jesus, God sends the beautiful Holy Spirit into our heart. And the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our heart. He pours the love of God into our heart that makes us secure in the Father so that then we can love others. It was from a place of wholeness that Christ ministered to the disciples. John said that when Jesus washed their feet, he, he did so from a place of inner wholeness, knowing that the Father had put everything under his power. It didn't threaten Jesus to serve others, even to do a slave's job, because Jesus was completely secure in the Father's love for him, and the Holy Spirit enables us to do the same. Carry the burdens of others, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Can I tell you that there are people in our Harvest Time family who are carrying burdens right now that are too big for them to carry on their own. There are people who are fighting sickness. There are people with financial needs, single moms and dads struggling to raise kids on their own, people caring for aging parents, people who are lonely. 
There are others who are carrying sin burdens that they can't tackle on their own. Addictions, obsessions, relationship problems. People who have grown spiritually cold. In my home church, there was a woman who started attending whose husband was the CEO of a major company in Philadelphia. If I said the name of the company, you would recognize it instantly. But she had a problem. She was a chronic shoplifter. She would go into CVS and she would steal Maybelline lipstick and nail polish and makeup. And it wasn't because she had a financial need. Her husband gave her a monthly allowance of spending money to use for anything she wanted. And her monthly spending allowance was bigger, one month allowance was bigger than my mom's entire annual salary as a small business owner. But it was a compulsion that started when she was a little girl and she couldn't stop it. She was arrested many times. It was a great embarrassment to her husband. It cost them enormous amounts of money to avoid prosecution and avoid the unwanted publicity. She tried everything. She went to psychiatrists. She went to hypnotists. She went on medication. And finally, she tried Jesus. It was a burden she couldn't carry on her own. But fortunately, there were people in our church walking in the spirit. My mom was one of them. And they were able to restore her. They led her to faith in Jesus. They prayed over her in deliverance prayer. They led her into the beautiful baptism of the Holy Spirit. They discipled her. They genuinely befriended her and not only was she set free totally from that compulsion but she became the leader of a ministry that helped set hundreds of other people free too you see that's the goal to be people of the spirit filled with the fruit of love serving people in love like Christ and restoring them mending the tears in their souls through the spirit of gentleness. Beloved, can I tell you, that's what this building next door is all about. I want to tell you, it's a spectacular building. I was so happy when I got home and saw the glass and the skylight. Thank you, by the way, for your patience. I know it's a little rough out there in the parking lot, and I apologize for that. We're working as fast as we can to get it put back. Everything in the parking lot has to get kind of moved over a little bit, and so it's a lot of work. We're, we're trying to do it as quickly as we can. Thank you for being patient, but I was so happy. First thing I did Saturday morning was I, I got up, and I was walking around up uh, in the new building up in the rafters looking at the skylight, and I have to say, it is a spectacular building, but you know, it's really not about that. What it's really about is that there's just not enough space in this building to do all the work that we're doing right now. Monday night grief share and divorce care and encouragement for single parents. Tuesday night pathways, we've completely outgrown the building so that we had to uh, expand to Thursday mornings uh, where we're doing pathway ministry. Uh, Wednesday nights, taking care of families, helping parents to build better marriages and help with their kids. That's what it's all about. It's, it's not about the spectacular architecture. It's about a place for restoring people. How do we become people like that? How do we get from where we are today to, to people who are restorers? Well, Paul says we get there by walking. We get there by day by day, taking one step at a time. And we sow service and we reap a harvest. Four ways to walk in the Spirit. Four ways to walk in the Spirit. Finally this, sow your money starting with your local church. Sow your money, starting with your local church. In chapter 6 of Galatians, Paul extends the instruction. Worship team, you can come help me. In chapter 6, Paul extends the instruction to carry other burdens to include the financial support of the local church and assistance to those in need, especially fellow believers. He says, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things. That means financial support with his teacher. That means your pastors here at the church. And the lines that follow continue in the same vein of giving. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So let us not be weary in doing good. For in due season we'll reap if we don't faint. Therefore, let us take every opportunity to do good to all men especially to fellow believers. You know, of all letters in the New Testament, it's surprising that Galatians should end with a word about giving. 
Galatians is the letter of Christian freedom. Christ has set us freed from the law. Galatians is called the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. We don't really expect a letter that's all about grace to end with a series of imperatives that culminate with an imperative to give money. It surprises us that this final section about walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, staying in step with the Spirit should end with a word about giving. But maybe we failed to see giving for the deeply spiritual act that it really is. Beloved, listen, giving is more than just our Christian duty. It's more than driven by the practical need to fund the church. It's true, it takes a lot of money to build the church. It takes a lot of money to maintain and operate the church. It takes a lot of money to keep the lights on. About $10,000 a month in this building. I don't think we're going to save a lot because of the skylight in the new building. It takes money to keep the church clean and to staff it and resource it. But giving money is much more out of a duty of necessity and it's much more than an obsolete obligation to the law. In these crowning verses of Galatians, Paul elevates giving by describing it in the highest spiritual terms. Generous giving is the apex of a life that is controlled by the Spirit. Giving is a final act in a whole string of acts walking in the Spirit that prove that we're really heirs of eternal life. Paul says financially supporting your pastors, your church, missions, your fellow brothers and sisters is sowing that pleases the Spirit. It pleases the Spirit because it's an exercise of faith. Every time I bring my tithe check, I am trusting that the God who provided for me this week is going to provide again next week. Every time I bring my offerings, I'm trusting that there's going to be manna for my family again tomorrow morning. It pleases the Spirit because it's an exercise of submission and self-control. It's acknowledging Jesus' lordship over my entire life, including my finances. Giving is an ultimate expression of laying down our lives in service for others. I know how hard I work for my paycheck, and I know you work hard for yours too. My work keeps me from my wife at times, keeps me from my kids at times, keeps me from recreation at times, it keeps me from sleep at times, and yours does too. And when we write that tie check, when we give to missions, when we make offerings to the building, we are literally laying down the very hours of our life to help carry the burdens of others. Don't ever belittle giving by calling it a duty or worse yet, by calling it an unnecessary obligation to the old law. It's one of the highest forms of sacrifice that I can offer to the Lord and it is the apex of a life fully engaged in walking in the Spirit. What is the harvest of walking in the Spirit? A few things quickly. First of all, we reap the subjugation of our sin nature. We're not bothered anymore about the things that we cannot do because we have a changed mind. Paul says the Holy Spirit refocuses our minds. We reap the fruit of Christ's likeness the fruit of the Spirit. We reap eternal life, not because we've earned it, but because it's clear that Christ owns us. And we reap a harvest in kind. We have sown mercy and we reap mercy. We have sown service to others and we reap service from others. We have sown restoration and we reap restoration. We have sown financial support and we reap financial blessing. Beloved, let's experience victory by walking in the Spirit. Stay connected to the Spirit. Feed your faith. For the sake of others, address the issues in your backpack. Serve others in love like Jesus did. And sow, sow your money, starting with your local church. Would you stand and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place this morning?